So after presenting Faro 3, um, which is the next release, this is about Faro 4. So this means this is not about anything that exists at all, but this is just plans and dreams about the version after the next version. So it's a bit early because we are hard working with Faro 3 out so that there are still some bugs left. And we, are, we still need to work a bit on getting it uh, really stable in all details. Um, I mean, it's already quite usable, but sometimes you hit into things in the browser that don't work or things like that. So we need to, to fix that. So because of that, there's not much that happened with Faro 4. So people started to discuss a bit what should we do. And then there are lots of things that already happened. And so we will see. I will present some possibilities. So the idea is that this is not about the future of Faro. It's about one year. There will be Faro 5, there will be Faro 6, there will be Faro 20. And this is about Faro 4. And it's not even about one year, because we need to stabilize at the end. And as it has shown, we need around three months of stopping to change stuff. So at the beginning, it's stopping to change big stuff. And at some point, we start to get more aggressive in not doing anything. Sometimes this fails, like last week. But um, more or less, this is the idea that it gradually gets only bug fixes, nothing else. And so we have nine months. <laughs> And nine months is not a lot of time. So um, in the end, that means that this will be not the last Faro version and there will be everything fixed that is not bad or, or all will be done that it will be ever be. No, it's just one iteration. Think about the difference between Faro 2 and Faro 3, the same thing. The reason why, why we, we do it like this is that everything we, we do in one release, we can use in the next one. So for example, we put a new compiler in, in Faro 3, we will kick out the old compiler in Faro 4, and then we can use the features of the Faro compiler and Faro 4 to do fancy stuff, which I will explain a bit. So there are lots of ideas. So there's the stuff about slots, which I will talk about, there's objectivity, which I will talk about, there's the idea of going to a one file Faro, uh, which I will discuss a bit. There is a lot of discussion about tools where they not show anything because there's nothing yet to show, or it's not really my topic, even so maybe that there should be something presented. There are lots of nice tools in Moose, for example, where we can learn from. There's uh, something about going on about Git integration. There's Athens to really use the, the vector canvas to render the desktop. Bootstrap I will talk about. Virtual Machine I will not talk about at all. So the, for example, Sista, where Clément is working on right now. Uh, so you can ask him if you want to have more information about that. But I want to talk a bit about the Bootstrap. And um, this is actually the work of, of Gishe, who is here. So if you want to ask uh, specifics about that, he will show you gladly very fancy demos, I'm sure. So the idea is, right now, this uh, small talk image is um, there is no way of recreating it. So the image was created uh, by writing it out of Smalltalk 76. And then we had an image, and we just moved it forward. So there is no definition of. Uh, in, in, in code that would recreate and sort of, uh, uh, an image. So it's really the, the same thing from Smalltalk 82 today, Smalltalk 76. So this is very nice in one in some directions. I really love the image itself as a concept, but having no way of recreating it at all is a problem because you cannot really con control a lot what it contains. What you need to do is, and what we do now is to to have our Faro release, which contains lots of stuff, and then we shrink it down. So for Faro 3, there was Pavel did a lot of very nice work, and he managed to shrink down uh, Faro 3 to 4.5 4 megabyte, and he can load back everything. So he can remove uh, Morphic and load it back, for example. It's already quite nice. It's a lot of work, and you always need to redo this work. So it's a lot of, a lot of work. And so we want to actually control what the image contains by having a defined script that says, first load this, first load this, then load this. And then we know, so if you then do a server, you can actually configure the script to build the perfect image for your server. Use, for example. And um, another thing is that it makes much, much easier to do radical changes. If you now change something like how traits really are used in the system, or if or one thing, slots, slots needs uh, an instance variable in behavior. That was quite a work. So we did that actually in Faro 2. So in Faro 2, we added a layout instance variable to the class behavior that we didn't use until we reached Faro 3. Because actually, the JIT crashes when you add a variable. So we needed to use the interpreter, and it was a mess. And there are lots and lots of changes like, that are really hard to do in a living environment. And if you have a, a script, you can actually do radical changes very easily. So you could actually change the script 
to be a prototype-based small talk-like language or a traits-only language and then experiment easily with that. Another thing is that it enforces modularity. It makes really clear what is the kernel, what do I load first, what I lo lo do I load second, and if you use something that is actually filed in later, then it does not work. So it's actually quite nice. The idea is that we will actually use an, a running Faro system to build from a Git repository a new Faro system from scratch, really stitching together all the basic objects, behavior, meta class, whatever. So if you want to know more about that, we have already published some papers about that. And there are lots of nice uh, demos to, to show. Uh, the idea is that this exists for Faro 3, or maybe even Faro 2, no, Faro 3 in, in between, as a prototype. And we are thinking of why don't we use that on the build server, too, that every commit actually builds a new image from scratch. We will see. Um, another thing is related to the image, too. We love image, the concept of the image. And we should actually make it much more prominent and much more usable. And one of the strange things about Smalltalk right now is that we have this, uh, these three files. So we have the image file, which contains the whole Smalltalk world, but not the source code, which is in the changes and sources file. And the question is, why don't we start to simplify that? Because it's really complicated. It's complicated to explain. The first thing you need to explain to someone starting with Smalltalk is like, image, download, it's not a picture, and then sources, yeah, but this, and then it's really complicated. And the code in the system is ridiculously, amazingly complicated. So the, the first step of that is we need to replace the mechanism of dot .changes, because dot .changes serves two purposes. It stores, uh, it's stores the source code, like the dot .sources, and it's a log of what you do, so that if your system crashes, that you always have a transaction log of the code that you wrote, so that you can never lose code. And for that, uh, actually, Martin, who is here too, implemented something called Epicea, which is a high-level uh, change model for Smalltalk, which uh, models what the changes model changes now model, but on a high level with real objects. And for example, support aggregate changes so that you can model all uh, IDE events, like refactoring is then an event, and it has sub-events, which are the rename and things like that. And this can be serialized to disk independently of how the sources and changes so that it has per session a transaction log that is written to this. Very nice. And it has a very fancy browser with which you can actually look at your history, which actually works compared to the one that we have for the changes, for changes file, which is honestly unusable for anyone. Um, then, of course, this is the dot .changes, but nevertheless, the dot .changes file has two, um, two uses. For one, it it is the transaction log, and this, the second thing is that it saves the source code. The source code is either old and it's in dot sources, or it's new and it's in dot changes. And so we need to uh, solve that too. And there the question is, I mean, it's not 1978, but it's 2014, and the memory sizes look a bit different. So if you would design Smalltalk now, would you actually put in all this effort into a dot sources and dot changes mechanism? At the, while at the same time, our image contains lots of other data. We have around five megabyte of fonts in the image. We have uh, all the compact methods, even of the dead, uh, never used code in the image. There's a lot of stuff in the image, but only for source code. We have a really complicated machinery to read it from disk. That kind of does not make sense. So the idea is that um, we should solve that problem on a higher level. So if we have a space problem, and we are talking about megabyte here, in the like five megabyte, if and there's a in Faro 3 right now, there's five megabyte multi channel meta me metadata in the image, and nobody cares about that. So the question is, why don't we put it just in the image, simplify everything, and if we have a space problem, we solve that for all objects on another level. Of course, this is possible because we only need the current version of the source code. Everything else is in the code history anyway. So it's not that, that, uh, that much. And if you compress it, it's really around 5, 6 megabytes. So that's the image. So one of the ideas of Faro 4, one dot Faro image, not the three things. And this, of course, simplifies deployments and all, all, all of these things. The other thing which I already uh, started to talk about with um, the new compiler in Faro 3 is the slots. So the slots, the idea is that it's a first class instance wrapper. So right now, people always are very proud of small talk, like everything is an object, you know, everything. And then you look at instance wrappers and <coughs> there is no object. You can ask the class for instance wrapper names and you get an array with the names of the instance wrappers, but there's nothing that models the instance wrapper itself. So um, they have experiments like that in the past. There are for visual works. I think there is the one that makes uh, instance variables into objects. 
Uh, and this one is one of one instantiation that um, does make instance variables into objects, and it actually allows you to subclass this this class and make your own kind of instance variables. So, one example that is maybe the one that is the easiest to explain is the property object. So, the, a, a property slot um, is a slot that is you, you can use it like an instance variable. So, just write the name to read and you assign to assign it. But the compiler in the back actually um, compiles the code to access one shared dictionary, and it actually gathers all the property slots of the whole hierarchy into one dictionary for the for the object. So, so an object where, in the, where you have a property slot has one dictionary associated with it, and there you store the, the state. And the nice thing about that is that you can use uh, then a lot of, or you can define a lot of uh, property slots that are not used, and they will not take more space. So right now, if you look at Morphic, it has uh, Morph, which is a relatively small object with four instance variables, and then it has Morph extension, which has another 10 instance variables and a, a property dictionary because there's so much state that sometimes is needed, sometimes not. And this, with this, you can actually model that uh, as part of the language. Instead of adding a morph extension, you can actually add property slots. Or another thing is uh, a Boolean slot. Boolean slot means that you say, OK, in this instance variable, I can only store true and false. And that means that the class builder gathers all Boolean slots together and models them as just one small integer object. And when you access this Boolean, it generates the needed code to mask out the bits to access this, this bit in the, in the integer. And that's very, very nice uh, for things like, like Morphic. In Morphic, in Morphic extension, you have around, I don't know, five instance variables that are just flags. Five flags, five times 32 bit for just five tr true or false. And this one allows you to model that much nicer. Another thing that you can do is you can have alias slots or virtual slots that are actually not there at all, so they are computed on demand. Or you can have active slots that when you store something, they tell someone else that something happens, which is very nice for graphical things. Or you could even move it up to your domain and you could make uh, re relationships that you know from UML and implement those with slots. Um, or you could um, go in the direction of having meta description for your instance variable directly attached to the slot itself. So right now there, there is, in the Seaside community, there is a package where you describe on the class side, you have description methods for all your instance variables that then are used, for example, to auto-generate editors for this uh, domain object in, in Seaside. And this could be done directly with slots. So kind of a nice uh, thing. If you want to learn more, this actually was published at Uppsala some years ago. And this explains to you all the, the details of how this actually, the class builder uh, works together with the layouts and the slots to provide all these things. And it has some very nice examples, for example, traits with state uh, realized using this. So related, or well, not really related, um, but another interesting thing that we want to actually do with Faro 4 is to um, provide much better behavioral reflection capability. So Smalltalk is a reflective system, but actually it's not that great if you look at the details. So if you want to hook into instance variable access, it's kind of difficult to do. There is no way that you, that there is no meta object protocol to hook into instance variable access or message sense. If you say, okay, in this class, I would like to replace the normal message sense of the virtual machine with uh, something else. Not really possible. And uh, partial behavior reflection is actually a very uh, flexible, uh, low-level framework to provide behavioral reflection for uh, small talk. And the idea is that you associate, using a so-called link object, uh, any kind of structural object in your system with a meta object that, that describes how things should happen. And you can put these uh, meta object either on slots or on AST nodes in general. So uh, this would is a, is a explanation of it. So imagine you have a method which actually is an abstract syntax tree, then you can really put a link object on the node that describes how to call a meta object. And um, why, why would you want to do that? So it allows you to change behavior for any kind of operation in your system by selecting the right AST nodes and putting links onto them. And this could be like all assignments of that class or this message sent or uh, this message sent and this instance variable access, things like that. So it's a cross-cutting selection of, of uh, operations that can be bind, bound to one meta object. 
And all this without changing program codes. So it happens on the level of the AST, and so it it's doesn't show up in your, in your code. It's really a reflective operation. So lots of nice uh, things that you can do with it. So the full model looks a bit like this. You have your AST at the, at the lower, lowest one, then you have your links to your meta objects, and any link has an activation condition that can be, can be true or false, so you can turn them off and on, and it defines which method to call and what to provide. So for example, for a message send, you want to provide the name and the arguments, so you can specify that as part of the link, and then it would, would provide as parameters to the meta object those uh, information. So it's very, very nice. So for example, a direct use that everyone can, can use immediately is breakpoints, because you can put a node, uh, a link on a node, where the meta object is halt, and the link knows what it should do is uh, now, and so it does halt now, and it stops. Or you could make watch points using that very easily, where you say, okay, I want to display uh, this information uh, in, in a watcher, and then the watcher is the meta object, and it specifies where to go. Another thing that you can do is you can build profilers. So everything that you do with kind of bytecode manipulation or ASC manipulation or uh, method wrappers or something like that, you can do with this. So in the end, it's a bit, you can see it either as glorifying breakpoints, who are more flexible than normal breakpoints, or you can see it as uh, method wrappers that are um, made general enough so that they actually can wrap not only methods, but any AST node or the slots themselves. So you can do lots of stuff, coverage analysis, or you can do aspect-oriented programming using it, because it actually, in, in a way, it actually takes uh, partial, uh, reflection, behavior reflection, and brings everything from AOP that was there more than in reflection back into the uh, reflective layer. And m most of that is the cross-cutting aspect, so that you can select whatever cross-cutting classes, cross-cutting operations, and put everything on one meta object instead of in a class, uh, in a kind of CLOS-like uh, meta object protocol where all, always the class is the meta object. So it's very flexible and I think it will allow us to do a, a lot of very nice uh, things. How much time do I have still? Still. Um, uh, minus. Oh, that's a lot. So, I'm faster than I thought. So, and beyond. So, this is only Faro 4. And the question is, of course, always what will we really be able to do in nine months? So maybe one of those will be dropped. Or it will be only partly done, so maybe we will have the, uh, the nice change model, but still have source, sources and changes around. I don't know. We will see. Um, so on the, on the long term thing is that the idea is to do run release every year. So like we did for our 3 and now for our 4, to continue that for the next years, with always the idea to uh, build something in one release that we then can use in the other one, other release. So in this case, it's slots and, uh, uh, and the compiler, for example. In the next release then, when, when we have the, the, um, the, s the slots model fully integrated in the system, then we can start to use the slots. So in Faro 5, we might then have a morphic where we don't have morphic extension anymore, but we use actually property slots. Or we can uh, maybe then use the reflectivity subsystem for something really crazy. So we will see. It, it will be very interesting. Another thing that, that one should see is that um, this is about Faro. This contains some of the research results that we do at, uh, at AirMod at INRIA, or that other people do. So for example, PlayArt in, in Chile, or SEG in Bern. It contains some of this research, but it is not directly the research. So the idea is that research happens in parallel, and only when the research reaches a level where we say, okay, this makes sense to make real, then we, in a second step, make it real. And often it actually means that you have a prototype and then you need to completely redo the pro prototype uh, again for making something real. And maybe it will only be part of it or a simplified version or something like that. So lots of interesting uh, things are happening in research and it's a sadly a completely different talk. So there cannot be a lot of content of that here. Another uh, thing is that, um, Oh, it's already the last slide. Another thing that I have not talked about at all is virtual machine level things. So there are lots of interesting things happening on the research level uh, and some on the uh, kind of engineering level. So for example, we have on the CI server, we can actually now, or already since before Faro 3 already, we can build all three virtual machines on the CI infrastructure automatically after every commit. And that was a lot of work. So the, the whole uh, infrastructure of the virtual machine was never built uh, with continuous integration in mind. It was not even built with the idea that someone else then 
one person would ever need to build it per platform. And so it was kind of difficult to do. Um, but now it's, it's done. So now that means we can actually, if we need to change something small, we can do the change and it will build all the things on all three platforms and it will run all tests and then we know that this works or not. And that's, that's quite, quite interesting. Another direction that we are going is that we will, of course, integrate all the, the uh, work on the new garbage collector in Faro 4. And we are working uh, in collaboration um, with Elliot on the um, SISTA infrastructure to do type feed-based based, based optimization in the, in the language. And that will be very, very interesting. So if you want to uh, learn about that a bit, Clément is here who is working on that. Uh, he can show some, some stuff. And this will actually, I think, push the performance quite, quite high. So we get around 40% from the new garbage collector, but then we will get a factor maybe of two or something like that from the optimizations again. OK, any questions? That, yeah, that someone not needs to do that. Yeah, so that that's just a matter of compiling it with the correct um, app store. No, the the. So you need to be a registered developer, and then you get your uh, certain stuff, certain. And you is your team a, a registered Apple developer? Uh, I think so. Yes, so the re research. Oh. We have a research account. Armod is registered, but not part. Armod, yes. And uh, yeah, we need to look into that. So I think that it's mostly a matter that nobody had the energy and time to do it. Yeah. Because it's actually quite complicated. Another part of making it real. Exactly. So, and it would actually be important because that now it just closes it on the newest Mac OS, which is a bit sad. And it would be nice to put it into the store at some point. So if we simplify how these things work with sources and changes and find a very nice model uh, of actually uh, putting it into one application, then it would be nice if it would be put on the store too. Yeah, there's already a Feral launcher in the store, so it'd be nice exactly. To the whole thing. But the Feral launcher is, is purely written in Objective C, so it's an Objective C application that gathers all your images, and then you can double click on it. There is now a Feral launcher written in Faro, which is very interesting. So that might be part of the, the solution. It actually even queries the build server, so you can uh, you can select any of the um, the images of the last weeks to, to start. And all the projects, even on the contribution uh, CI, you can start with a click, so it's kind of nice. Yeah. What other cool research is happening? What other cool research is happening? Good question. Um, <coughs> so we have virtual machine related research, so one direction is the, the sister uh, work, the other is to rethink uh, how to eventually have a virtual machine that's written completely in small talk and not in slang but in, in real small talk. That's a, a long-term uh, project. Um, there is... Uh, what else would then? Yeah, uh, we, huh? Migration rules. Ah, the migration rules, yeah. There is one uh, PhD student who actually mines the repository of, of the Faro commits to automatically uh, detect things that end users should change between releases. So he uh, yeah, finds automatically changes and uh, presents to you on your code base, ah, maybe you should change this. And that's uh, actually quite nice. So he had a, an example, so like a questionnaire, like what do you think about the following rules between Faro 2 and Faro 3? And it was quite nice. So it actually catched all these uh, things that, that we remember that people need to change. And the idea is to automatically actually make uh, transformation rules out of that, so that you actually uh, can um, can apply the rules semi-automatically. So it says, you should change that, should I try to change it for you? And then uh, you get a change log where you can say, yeah, yeah that looks good. So when we can really support 64 bits memory, we can really load all packages of all versions from whole small talk up and squeak source in a large system and do those analysis on one system at the same time. There is then the research of Gisha about uh, bootstrapping the, the image and having images uh, as uh, more like objects with an external API and that you can remotely in introspect and browse. Um, we have Martin working on the Epicea model. Yeah. I 
things like that. Okay, thank you very much.